these kids they're not they're not going to TikTok to look for news. It's it's being slipped to them, you know. And 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 so much of what we want to say is, you know, show them instances from the past, equip them with the tools to fight misinformation. Um but the general apathy is they want the mindless scroll and it just seeps in. It just it it that misinformation is there in the background uh sometimes in the foreground. Um and they they soak it up. Welcome to What's the Big Idea? I'm your host Dan Carney. I recently read this in a news story. Quote, I think that for the most part, teachers are excited about it, said Barbara Stein, an education technology analyst at the National Education Association. This is sort of the ultimate enhancement of resources for the classroom. But I do think teachers have been frustrated sometimes at trying to identify the best uses of the new technology. Close quote. The source of this quote? A September 2000 article in the Washington Post titled, Internet at School is Changing the Work of Students and Teachers. The report highlights the excitement and apprehension surrounding the Internet's first widespread use in schools, schools which, the article points out, suffer from shortages of tech-trained teachers. But the awe at the possibilities of the Internet in education is palpable throughout the piece. Well, flash forward almost 24 years later, and we're at what feels, to many, like another inflection point in technology, media, and ultimately, media literacy. There are varying definitions of media literacy. For today's purposes, I'll go with how it's framed by Media Literacy Now, an advocacy group. It's the ability to decode media messages, assess the influence of those messages on our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and to create media thoughtfully and conscientiously. Just try this. Type media literacy into Google News and see how much attention this issue is getting right now. And of course it is. The proliferation of information, misinformation, and disinformation, especially as we enter an election year, all supercharged by social media and partisan divides, means that we're living in an era that those teachers from 2000 could never have dreamed up. And then along comes ChatGPT, which has unleashed whole new currents of excitement, bewilderment, possibilities, and fear. And as with so many other societal trends, schools are at the tip of the spear. The good news is that there are a lot of people and organizations doing some amazing thinking and work with media literacy, many of which I've linked in the show notes and some of which you'll hear discussed in today's conversation. I reached out to Tim Kruger, a teacher in Syracuse, New York, who's deeply engaged with and teaching about media literacy. My hope is that this conversation gives you something to think about in your own media literacy journey and some new tools to add to your repertoire. How did you, what was your journey to becoming uh, a media literacy junkie, somebody who's really into the idea of media literacy? What, how, what, what got you there? Uh, we were doing the presidential election of 2006, 2020, the 2020 election. Um, and I always do a thing with my eighth graders. Um, I side with, uh, they, they go on the, web, do you know the website? You, 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 you give your, your views and then it shows you kind of where you fall percentage wise. Right. Right. So uh, this was COVID year. So, you know, I remote all of that stuff. And I had the kids doing, um, they would, they would put into a Google classroom, like who they would, who they think they would vote for. And then they do the I side with, and then they put in who I side with said they would vote for. And I had several parents who were very angry about this. And I, I literally sat down on my computer one day after, you know, all the phone calls that were coming into my principal and, and whatever. And um, there was a survey on my uh, on my email uh, from AFT, and I anger replied to the survey, which you should never do. Um, and I got put. I was I joined up with this group that was uh, the civics design team through AFT, and we have created 
um, uh, uh, civics training for teachers across the country. Um, and I dove into the media literacy aspect of it. Um, and, you know, through several companies and, you know, several websites out there and all of that, we did, you know, hours and hours of research and it's just mind boggling. And I watched these kids and the other thing that got me into this, that same year I had my ninth graders were in class and a kid raised his hand, great kid, and says, Mr. Kruger, is, is Helen Keller real? And I'm like, <laughs> what? What do you mean? They're like, there's no way she did all those things. Like that is, she was made up. And I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. Well, this is a TikTok trend at the time that Helen Keller didn't really exist. And I was just blown away by that, the power of social media to alter history, you know? Um, so that's kind of the running joke with my classes, all my successive AP classes after that, they're like, hey, uh, Mr. Kruger, we heard that uh, Helen Keller's not real, <laughs> just to get me going. Anyway, so that was kind of my journey. I, I heard that too. Some students were asking me that. I didn't understand why they were asking me that though. Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of teachers, teachers who are interested in media literacy or think about media have moments like that. It's like the, the, the scene from Jaws, like we're going to need a bigger boat when something happens and you're like, oh, this is even bigger than I thought. I remember just a few years ago, priming a media literacy mini unit. And before I could even get into it, we were just doing some simple Google searches. And as I watched them interact with Google, it was, it was like they had no conception of sort of how to use Google. And I thought, right. oh, this is this is actually a, a far bigger <laughs> issue than I thought it was. Um, what do you make of the, you know, we've, we've been told for years about young people being digital natives. What's your, what are your thoughts on that concept? I heard a great, and I don't remember where I heard this. Um, I heard a, a, analogy to cell phones and, and internet and digital and all of this to cars, you know, um, we didn't really understand cars. Like the first, I remember sitting in the back of a station wagon. I remember riding in the back of a pickup truck, you know, out on the farm. Um, and then, you know, safety belts and, and all of these things come over time. Well, we're, we're in that same boat and we're the adults now who we didn't grow up with this digital age. Um, and we're the ones that are stuck trying to figure out what the safeguards are for this. How, how, how do we, how do we instill the, the equivalent of safety belts into media for our students? How do we instill, um, this idea of media literacy to kids who are uh, tech savvy and, and, and this is all they've grown up with. Like they, they don't understand what a map was, you know? Um, so yeah, they're, they're they're very advanced in some ways and they're so naive in others um and it's it's a quite a juxtaposition that we're stuck trying to figure out how to teach them the right way does that answer your question no it totally does I, it, it really it mirrors my own thinking that the gulf between what they can intuitively do with technology but their ability to evaluate it and and there's so much of it. There's so much coming at them that maybe it's unfair to even say that they can't evaluate it or process it. But I agree with that. You, you use the seatbelt analogy. So maybe now is a good time to sort of ask for your definition of media literacy. What, when, when you use that phrase, what do you mean? So many people want to frame it in into a political perspective. And, and there is that. But it's just the ability to analyze, you know, and evaluate information from a variety of sources and from a variety of mediums, you know, to, to kind of distinguish fact from fiction. I, I guess that's my biggest thing. D decide whatever you are reading is trustworthy. I think that's the, the, the short of it, right? I think so. Yeah. It's the, um, when there's so much information out there and it's, you can get to it very quickly. And I think that's what challenge we have with students is that it's the, I'm going to jump on the first thing I found looks great. I'm going to use it. Um, why didn't we need media literacy? Why was, why was media literacy not talked about when we were kids? Well, so that's a good point, right? Like I had to open up encyclopedias and read about information. 
I think about that. That's a really phenomenal question. Who who told us that that was right? In the same sense, when we talk about media and news organizations, people have been complaining about it for a long time. You know, I remember when Fox came out and it was like, we're going to be fair and balanced and it's going to be, and I didn't really understand that there was a left leaning bias to ABC, NBC, CBS um, until Fox told us there was. And it's interesting now because there are so many news outlets and now so many news outlets with a web page. And, and I guess we just took it to heart that that's what it was, but I, I'm pretty sure even as a kid, uh, high school, I remember thinking that, or at least knowing that the media leaned in one direction. So, it was already there to a certain extent. We didn't have the, the 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 variety, and we didn't have the quick access. Like even talking about having a conversation about who's the best quarterback of all time. Like now you can pull up numbers. Like back then, well, this is what I think, and it worked, <laughs> right? And media was so much simpler in its packaging, at least. Right, you had. Newspaper newspaper and you had your three four tv stations which in their defense were they may have been gatekeepers but they were professional you know exactly. today young people get their news on tiktok and right. um there's 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 a price to be paid for the speed which we get it there there's you know this reminds me of there's a um professor in in washington mike caulfield who's written a lot about media literacy and something he wrote years ago struck me you know this what you were talking about the uh, separating fact from fiction and what's trustworthy and what's not. And he said that we're, we're in an age now where the big, one of the biggest threats is what he called the gullibility of the cynic that people begin to internalize the idea that nothing's really trustworthy, but what, but as soon as you start to think nothing's trustworthy, you really are opening yourself up to fall for anything. And he, sure. and, and he, 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 he calls media literacy a currency and he says, you have to be careful where you spend it, but you, you have to spend it. You have to be able to put your trust somewhere or else you're really opening yourself up to, I think a lot of the things that we're talking about, the ha, Helen Keller's not real phenomenon. And don't get me wrong. These kids, they're not, they're not going to TikTok to look for news. It's, it's being slipped to them, you know? And, and, and so much of what we want to say is, you know, show them instances from the past, equip them with the tools to fight misinformation. Um, but the general apathy is they want the mindless scroll and it just seeps in. It just, it, it, that misinformation is there in the background, uh, sometimes in the foreground. Um, and they, they soak it up. So trying to teach them like the tools and whatnot to, to, oh, no, let's, let's find what's trustworthy. Um, let's check Snopes. Let's check factcheck.org. Let's, you know, let's do all those things. They don't, they don't want to do that. It's not, that's not where the comfort level is. So maybe we, we go there now and talk about what are the, the, the tools we can give them? What are you doing in your classroom? What's some work that you've done? I know you, you've, you've spent some time developing programs. I was just talking with my son the other day about muscle memory, you know, about yeah. what, what that means, how we, you know, learning to do something to the point where you don't think about it. Um, you know, is, is it possible, I guess my, my, my bigger question here, is it possible to build media literacy muscle memory in our students? Uh, but maybe we, we, maybe we can get to that. Maybe first we just kind of examine what are some, some tools and strategies that you use that you think are effective. Yes, you can build muscle memory from showing them how to go about. I mean, the very rudimentary one, Google search, notice that it says sponsored on the first three. Don't just trust the first one, right? Um, media literacy in terms of news media, um, I share with them, um, a couple of different sites. Probably the biggest one is Ad Fontes, their media literacy or their, uh, media bias chart, uh, which is phenomenal and constantly updated. And, and, and they're kind of blown away by that. What I'll do is I'll put it up on the board blank 
and then have them guess where they think CNN goes. And they put a sticky note up there that says CNN, a sticky note that says CBS, and a sticky note that says Fox and whatever. I, actually, I, I love this tool that you're talking about. I wonder if you could maybe take a second to explain to the listener um, the Ad Fontes uh, bias oh. chart, how it's laid out, and, and, and as, a, as a user, what you can get out of it. Oh, it's glorious. Um, I, I've been with them for a few years now. They put out a chart. Uh, that is not just a left-right bias chart. It's also, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, trustworthiness. Uh, so it goes from the very top being just fact reporting to the bottom being propaganda and everything in between, right? Um, so you've got the left-right skew. You've got the uh, fact reporting to opinion to um, propaganda at the bottom. And then what it does is they take and they've got, and they, and they say very clearly, we are biased we, uh, out of all the people that work on this everybody has their own biases and that's cool because we have both sides of it and they come to a consensus on what they've been seeing in terms of news organizations and sometimes they'll split them up between tv and web um and you can see a big difference between say cnn tv and cnn web are are different uh, same with fox anyway um and it lays it out in this kind of arc um on where they lie and it's it's fascinating to kids i mean they I, I will lose an hour on this thing because they're blown away by well how you know and and the questions they're asking are good and and then we go in and we start looking at their websites to see if they can spot that stuff um news literacy project does a great uh piece on that that i kind of beg borrowed and stole uh where they go in and look at it from a perspective of where where does this news organization gets its money um go to the about the website um tab and see you know what 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 their overall goal is but then to take a couple of websites and just compare them front page splash um what's the big news of the day and i did this this was a while back when trump was impeached the first time i really wanted to hit this home I went to, I did a screenshot of the uh, CNN website and a screenshot of the Fox website, just the front page. And it was, <laughs> CNN was impeached in bold. You couldn't even find the word impeached on the Fox one. And I'm like, guys, this is kind of what I've been talking about, right? Um, but Ad Fontes has been, has been fabulous. There's other sites out there that do a, a similar thing. Um, the one is escaping my mind right now. Uh, they do more on trustworthiness, uh, but they, they'll do the skew left and right as well. Um, there's a ton of different resources out there that people can go to, but um, the key is when you find that resource, like Ad Fontes, read about what they're doing and how they come up with their um, their rubric for this and how they they place these things. And I share that with the kids. I make them look it up and see, is this just some biased left wing or right wing site that's putting this up and and it's it gets it gets their wheels turning on that now is that something that they're going to do on their own someday hopefully but we can introduce it at least at this level healthy skepticism you're introducing i a teacher listening now might be wondering um is media literacy in your class a unit is it integrated into what you do and if it's integrated how do you do that because we know that as teachers, we're all, we already have so much we're trying to do. And even right. states right now are struggling, whether they mandate media literacy or not. And if they do, how do they do that? Because teachers are already pressured to get through so much content. So how do you work it into what you're doing? Yeah, no doubt. Um, so I, I, being in New York, uh, there is a push for media literacy. It's not mandated yet. I think there's only four states that have it mandated at this point. New York State has jumped on this seal of civic readiness. Uh, you can graduate with um, an extra little uh, thing on your diploma that says you have graduated with the seal of civic readiness. Um, and there's certain criteria that you have to hit, blah, blah, blah. I'm actually starting an elective in my school next year uh, on civics. Uh, and it's going to you know, touch on a lot of these things. Media literacy is a big part of it. Um, as well as you know, the, 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 the four pillars, I guess we call them, of, of civic learning. Um, but we do so much of it in our classrooms, you know, without even thinking about it. 
I just finished Yellow Journalism uh, in Spanish American War with my eighth graders. And that's a perfect opportunity to dive into sensationalism and bias, right? Um, my ninth graders, in terms of AP, I mean, they, that is one of the things that they do on the DBQ, you're, you're sourcing documents, right? Um, and if you just tie that in to today, it helps them understand how to source a document better because we've already been talking about current events and whatever in media literacy. So there are tie-ins everywhere. Um, in New York, I have a feeling we're heading towards a, a, a a mandate for media literacy. Um, we're not there yet, uh, but the seal of civic readiness will help with that. But so it, it, to do another unit, yeah, I can hear teachers balking and being like, what, what, where am I gonna, what am I gonna cut out to fit that in? Um, and I say, personally, at least in our school, we just, we, we touch on it when we can, uh, bring up current events and use that as a tool. Um, and, 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 <laughs> It's tough, you know, I live in a very purple district of New York, uh, which is some might find interesting. Um, I'm upstate. So it's, you gotta walk a thin, uh, kind of a thin line there in terms of um, showing bias all around rather than just, you know, beating some drum that some parents will find anti-Republican and so on. Yeah. there. There are just there are some issues that are very illustrative of what we're talking about, and they just tend to skew a way that some parents are not right. stoked about. Yeah. Um, how has AI and Chat GPT begun to complicate this issue? It already was complicated. Which already, a lot of teachers are feeling like I'm behind the eight ball on this. I play in catch up, and then along comes artificial intelligence. Yeah. What what are you seeing? What are you thinking? We're still in the early days of this, but where are you at on this? You know, our district, and I think a lot of districts are jumping on this and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to use it. Um, I, I think we have to teach them the tools. Uh, it's, it's wildly useful in some areas. Um, yeah, reverse image search, uh, fact-checking websites, you know, all of those create a general skepticism. Um, I, you know, I love talking about just look at the fingers on the pictures. You can see, you know, <laughs> um, these are all helpful programs in many places, um, harmful in others. Obviously, I'm going to let it write my paper for me. Um, I, I fear for our students' abilities to write uh, in the future when you've got a program that can just do it for you. Uh, but, you know, we've adapted. We've we've uh, if my kids write essays. They they. They do it on paper, um, but I, I don't think we can like try to hide it from them. I think we need to teach them the proper way to use it. And the kids have done some amazing things with it. It's it's actually kind of fun. We've been playing around with, um, I can't, we have a, an imaging um, AI that the media classes in our school have been playing with and uh, we, we had a ball with it, but I don't know. I think we have to, slowly incorporated as a tool um but we got to keep our eye on their their skills as well yeah I, I i think schools are remiss if they're not trying to uh oh, yeah. yeah get into it and, and like you said it's a tool and and it feels like, like in a lot of ways we're in the maybe early, very early 2000s when you can imagine a teacher looking at a student and saying you used the internet to get information for this? And we would have thought, right. well, why wouldn't I? It's, a, it's right. just an amazing new tool. And they're, I think they're thinking the same thing. Why wouldn't I use chat GPT? Um, but being really explicit about what the shortcomings are. No, no doubt. You know, at the beginning of this conversation, you were talking about you know, this whole uh, concept of what's real, what's not, what's trustworthy, what's not. And AI now with voice generation, video generation. I just this morning saw that in New Hampshire, today's the I think today's the primary for Republican. Yeah. There's a AI generated Joe Biden making robocalls. People are getting calls from Joe Biden, and it sounds just like him. Sure. Scary. It's it's really scary. What what we have. I remember when. Do you remember when the, um, it was on a talk show, 
and Bill Hader was on and they slowly, he was doing an Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, like accent. And then they, the, they did the deep fake where they slowly transformed his face into Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I remember thinking, this is years ago, thinking, wow, what, how are we going to tell what's real and what's not? This is just a fast forward on that, right? And so if we don't get, teach them what this is, if we don't introduce it to them and show them that there are benefits to it as well, but also how scary it can be, um, that's where building that general skepticism is just crucial, at the, especially even at this age. And on that note, I, I'm curious your thoughts on just the overlap or the interlock between digital, uh, media literacy and, and citizenship. You know, the, um, there's been so much, you know, just um, to read something from recently from the, the New York Times saying uh, about upcoming elections around the world. That baseless claims of election fraud have battered trust in democracy. Foreign influence campaigns regularly target polarizing domestic challenges. Artificial intelligence has supercharged disinformation efforts and distorted perceptions of reality. How can we, especially in, as social studies teachers, history teachers, how can we keep shaping responsible citizens and using media literacy as a way to do that? Well, first of all we have to make sure <clears throat> excuse me that they understand this is not new right like this is it, putting words in other people's mouths and and, and blatant falsehood that part of the reason that we the, the the program that we created for aft um my part on digital citizenship and media literacy uh is called what is truth um and and truth can be slippery it always has been slippery um I remember when we used to call it spin. That that was that was so much kinder and gentler back then. Now it's just fake news, right? Um, and and the spin up on this and the ability. I mean, like you just said robocalls from an AI Joe Biden. I mean, that's that's diabolic. Um, we need to make sure that our kids. The, the skepticism is part of it. The the deciding whatever that you're reading is trustworthy is is a huge part of that knowing the places that they feel they can trust to go to where the ad fontes does a great job with that you know all of this is a, is of a piece um but you know ben franklin said it best it's a republic if you can keep it and and we have to fight for it we have to fight for that trying to find the most honest path um and, and and teach them to do that but it, it's 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 amazing how you know i was just thinking as you were talking i was thinking about media especially the way it comes at us today and emotion you know like how it is supercharges our emotions and you know, one thing i often say to students is one of the best things you can do when you find something you come across something on TikTok, especially or instagram is just stop like, right. like, just give yourself a few minutes to think about it. So huge. Before, it, you, yeah. before you share, right? <laughs> yeah, and just the idea that if you if you just let it, maybe not even think about it, just let your subconscious mull over it for a bit. Come back to it. Yeah. But before you do anything with it, say anything about it, repost it, comment on it, give yourself a chance to really think about, is this is this something I should be sharing? Is this true? Right. Is this real? Is this is this intended? Uh, and and that's another thing that I teach them. You know, misinformation versus disinformation. You know, misinformation. Birds aren't real. It's freaking hilarious. I love it. Um, disinformation is designed to make you want to share something, create a response, an, an angry response, and 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 blast that out there. And I, and listen, there's social media um influencers out there that they're getting paid for this um there's other people that are just funny um and and make memes that are funny and and i'm down i i i'll do the mindless scroll now and then as well um but you, you hit it on the head just hold on before you before you share before you just let it sink in a little bit um that is that is such a good point Teaching in America is so decentralized. There's so many of us coming in different comfort levels. And and having someone like you 
who has thought about media literacy and can support other teachers, I think is really important for districts, for buildings. And I understand you've done some work with Cleveland. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, no, we, 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 we have teachers from all over the country. Um, there's five of us in the secondary, uh, one from Boston, um, two from Cleveland, one from Houston, uh, and then myself. Um, and we created a professional development um, that's focused around uh, s- the idea of citizenship, the idea of, I mean, it's basically, it's called deepening civic skills through classroom dialogue. And, and a huge part of that is the idea of dialogue in the classroom. How do we go about that? How do we get kids to feel comfortable sharing their ideas, having a discussion and not having it turn into a fight? Because if we can teach those skills at this age, the idea on the other end is they are able to have that civic dialogue. And so the first day we go through, you know, setting up the, setting the stage in the classroom, uh, you know, why civics matters, um, building a comfortable uh, classroom environment. Then I go into my piece on digital um, citizenship and media literacy. Um, I do one piece on social media, one piece on news media. Um, And then we dive into different types of um, classroom discussion, be it philosophical chairs, um, structured academic controversy, um, Harkness, uh, which I've used many times in class. It's fascinating and awesome. Um, And then trying to do some sort of, um, you know, project-based learning. Anyway, it's a two-day, it should be a two-day um, professional development. And our first time that we did that uh, as a pilot was in Cleveland. Um, brought in some teachers, and it, it was great. How does being someone that can engage in civil discourse, what's the overlap with having um, be, being a media literate person? So much of it is about just accepting other people's ideas, uh, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, you're, you're not going to change their mind by saying, no, no, hold on. I, I read it here, you know, um, being able to see both sides of an argument, even if you are adamantly opposed um, and, and, and being able to really a big part of this is giving teachers some strategies in their classrooms that on, on, to be able to talk about controversial issues, you know, um, teachers are clamoring for that. How do, how do I talk about the big news of the day? Well, uh, when Roe fell, it was, how do I, how do I have that discussion without feeling like I might get in trouble? Um, and the idea is presenting both sides and letting the students work it out. Um, so if, if kids are better at discussion and civil discourse and being able to have a discussion without it turning into a fight, maybe they'll be better at looking for what their truth is or what the truth is in their worldview. You know what I mean? Um, and maybe that will help them with when they're doing the mindless scroll. Well, that's not real. Or that makes me think maybe I should look that up. Um, as well as looking at the different media sites out there and saying, this one I know is skewed. This one is going to give me more of an honest truth. So I think they go hand in hand. I think all of it goes hand in hand. That media literacy is a civic skill, just like having a thoughtful discussion is a civic skill. And that's going to lead them more to the things like civic dispositions and then hopefully eventually civic participation. Very well said. I couldn't agree more with the how you phrased the media literacy as a civic skill. Um, I just want to get you out of here on this. Um, I mentioned Mike Caulfield earlier. He published a book with Sam Weinberg from Stanford last year called Verified. Very thoughtful book about um, media literacy. Yeah, very practical. It's a very practical text, um, more more than philosophical. But they at one point say um, something about, they're referring to, the, the dawn of the internet and those of us who sort of watch the internet grow and they, they write, it promised an information superhighway that 
would put us in the driver's seat. So why does it feel like the internet is driving us? <laughs> and I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on this idea that, you know, when it, when we're talking about media literacy and media and the, all of the ways that we receive it and what we receive, <laughs> I mean, I guess my question is like, how in control are we? And how, or how can we show students that they can be in control when sometimes it feels like, like they say, the internet's driving us? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you got to have the new iPhone. You got to have this. You have to have the, the the boost. You have to. It's capitalism, right? I mean, we we people found a way to make money off of it. Um, I'm doing the 30s here soon, and I always show them a, a few clips from Cinderella Man, and uh, the one part where he says, you know, you guys just haven't figured out a, a way to make money off of me. Uh, in this one scene. Um. Anyway. I, I guess that's the other part of this, the, the cynical skepticism we're trying to build in. Uh, we are not in the driver's seat. And, and we're, <laughs> as teachers, we're rarely in the driver's seat. We're reacting to what's coming at them. Um, but I mean, people are making money off of it. And, and I go back to the influencers, right? Somebody figured out a way to make money off of some of the most ridiculous things and and we're influenced by it because we are users of social media and the internet and and wow no we're capitalism that's the word <laughs> yeah and we didn't really even get into like just the the creation side of media literacy right i mean that's a whole other thing i, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that before we close but just you know, there's there's the passive consumption. There's some active consumption. If their minds are switched on, then there's the whole creation. And and oh, sure. how do you getting young people to think? You you, know, you don't you never want to stifle their creativity, their entrepreneurship, yeah. but how to do it in a way that is linked with being a good citizen, as you said. Well, it's funny. Um, I became uh, an influencer. I uh, I started an Instagram in which I share cocktail ideas that my wife and I were share. We call it cocktails on the porch because uh, we bought a house that has this beautiful porch and a little stream that goes by. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take pictures of these. And I'm going to send them out and 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 show the ingredients, and you can make this cocktail. And I'm like, I'm an influencer now with all 65 of my followers. Um, so I'm 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 a big deal, uh, but. <laughs> there's fun in that creation right there's fun in that oh i'm going to take the picture this way and and whatever um i've gotten spin drift to give me a thumbs up one time so that was that's one of my big you know uh accomplishments but these kids are making stuff that is mind-blowingly incredible i mean they're artistic in ways that i didn't know you could do with a phone and so that's great but you're right we have to teach them to be mindful about their own media literacy when they're sending stuff out because that could have a huge effect on someone else as well so yeah i, I no you're right you you hit it on the head you, you don't want to stifle their creativity but again mindfulness to all of this something tells me we'll be talking about this uh at it <laughs> for a long time <laughs> this yeah what's the new thing that's gonna uh, yeah oh, no. yeah yeah, uh, when when we when uh, when we get to like chat twelve, I'll give you a call back. We can talk and see how we're doing. Perfect, <laughs> Timothy Kruger. Thanks so much for taking the time yeah. to join me. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Um, you guys uh, take care out there. A big thanks to Tim Kruger for joining me. Something that struck me about our chat was how much all this media literacy is a work in progress. The nature of media means that to be truly literate in it, we need to be flexible and willing to grow and change. We don't have this all figured out and you shouldn't feel like you have to either. Stay open-minded, experiment, and be transparent about your thinking with your students and kids. And check out the show notes for resources and let me highlight one in particular. Verified, the new book from Mike Caulfield and Sam Weinberg. It's a brilliantly organized, often funny, and ultimately highly practical guide to living online without being duped. 
if you're a parent or a teacher or just someone interested in how we interact with media in the 21st century, this short book, this concise book is a must read. Thanks for checking out What's the Big Idea. As always, love to hear your thoughts and comments on Instagram, on threads, on X, at Big Idea Ed. Uh, this one in particular, this is such a dynamic, fast changing topic, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Stay safe out there, everybody. Hope you're having a great school year, a great 2024, and uh, we'll see you next time.